So last week we began our study in a book in the book of Exodus, and as I said last week, my prayer is that and hope is that when we study this book, the book of Exodus, is that we don't just hear stories of a Red Sea parting or the plagues or the Ten Commandments. Um, all these stories are fascinating to us that the, um, Hollywood has created movies on, but that beyond that, that in these stories we would see the eternal, all-seeing, all-knowing, all-powerful creator of the universe. That through these stories, we would have a better glimpse of who this God is that we serve. See, what we discover about God in his word is that he is true, he is satisfying, and that we can know him, not just intellectually, but that we can know him personally. That he wants us to know him. That he wants us to be in in an intimate relationship with him. Just consider just a few verses from Scripture about God's desire for us. In Jeremiah, God says this. He says, Let not the wise man boast in his wisdom. Let not the mighty man boast in his might. Let not the rich man boast in his riches. But let him who boasts boast in this, that he understands and knows me. That I am the Lord who practices steadfast love, justice, and righteousness in in the earth, for in these things I delight, declares the Lord. In Philippians, Paul's prayer is this, that, and he says this, that I may know him, that I may know the power of his resurrection and may share in his suffering, becoming like him in his death. See, the interesting part about coming to the Bible to understand God is that the Bible is not a textbook where we can just like kind of look in the index or at the back to get a definition and then find page numbers of where that word is defined. That's not what the Bible is. The Bible is the story. It's this incredible story, a true story through and true that where God many times uses narratives to teach us who he is. And so we look at these stories and the story of Exodus is a story about the nature and the character of God. That's what we're going to discover in this story. And last week, we talked about how God is unchanging, especially when it comes to his word and his promises, that what God said, he will do. That you and I, we can bank our lives on the promises of God. That if he said he will save you, he will save you. That he is absolutely faithful. That God promised to make this nation of Israel into a great nation. And even though Pharaoh tried to eradicate them from the, pl- from the face of the planet, and he put them into slavery and put them into suffering and started killing their babies, even though Pharaoh tried all of this, the people of God continued to grow and multiply, and God's hand was upon them. And today, we're going to see that God is eminent. Eminent. To say that God is eminent is to say that God is actively involved in his creation. The idea is that he refers to God's nearness, his presence on earth, especially with his people. It stresses his involvement in the affairs of our lives. God is present and involved in the details of your life and my life. And what we're going to discover is in Exodus 2 that God shows up constantly even though in the entire book, he, in the entire chapter, he isn't named at all, except at the end when we see the people praying that God would save them. God is close to us. He's eminent. Just consider these verses in First Kings chapter 8. But God will indeed dwell on the earth. Behold, heaven and the highest heaven cannot contain you, how much less this house that I have built. Jeremiah 23 says this, Am I a God at hand and not a God far away? Deuteronomy 4, Know therefore today and lay it on your heart that the Lord is God in heaven above and on earth beneath. There is no other. And Isaiah, For thus says the one who is high and lifted up, who inhabits eternity, whose name is holy, I dwell in the high and holy place and also with him who is of a contrite and lowly spirit to revive the spirit of the lowly, to revive the heart of the contrite. 
See, this means that God is infinite and therefore not subject to the limitations of humanity, of creation himself. He is far greater than anyone or anything he has made. But it also means that he's personal. He interacts with you and I as a person. And we relate to him as a person. You can pray to him. You can worship him. You can obey him. You can talk to him. You can love him. You can rejoice in him. And the flip side is also true. He can speak to you. He can rejoice in you. And he can love you. He loves you. See, when it comes to Christianity, it's not just information transfer or knowing some inspiring stories or even studying a textbook. It's about a real, vital, close relationship with God Almighty. He is a father. And he's not an absentee father who gave us birth and then walked off and occasionally sends us some gifts whenever he feels like it. He is a loving father, active, involved in the details of our lives. There is no other religion in the world where there is a God like this. The gods of the Greek and Roman pantheons were personal. They interacted with the people, but they were not infinite. They were They had weaknesses. They had frequent moral failures. They were constantly fighting among each other. But our God is infinite, and he's personal. See, on the other hand, there's deism and agnosticism that portrays a God who is infinite. He's powerful, but he's too far removed from the world to be personally involved in it. But we serve a God who, Exodus 3 will say, is the God who is the great I am. That means he's always here. God is now and God is here. Not God was or God will be, but he is here. And he is mighty and he is active and he is involved. And this morning what I want to do is just look at the first 10 verses of Exodus 2 and just give you one point from this story. And here's the point. God is involved in the minutia of your life. See, what I love about Exodus 2 is that we see a God working without ever hearing God's voice or ever having him named. But here he is, active in the mundane of life. See, most of our life is spent at this stage, routine, mundane, everyday details. But somehow we secretly think that God is only active in the spectacular Or that God is only active when we get together as a corporate body in the church. That's only where he's active. But God isn't just an EMT who meets us in a time of crisis. And he isn't a teacher who meets us in just corporate gatherings of worship. He's also a father who is with his children during everyday mundane portions of your life. Listen, don't get me wrong. God is with us in a special way when we gather together on a weekly basis and call on his name. That's true. And God does work in spectacular ways, and we're going to see that throughout the rest of Exodus, God showing up in amazing ways. But here in Genesis, Exodus 1 and 2, we find God just working through the mundane, the simple, everyday life of the people. God is eminent. The last verse of Exodus 22, where we le- Exodus 1, where we left off last week, This is where we left off last week. Pharaoh commands all of his people. He says, every son that is born to the Hebrews, you shall cast into the Nile, but you shall let every daughter live. Pharaoh goes from demanding midwives to kill baby boys to now basically says, hey, if you're an Egyptian and you see a Hebrew boy, take that boy, throw him into the Nile. He demands that all of his people Search out the Hebrew boys. Throw them into the Nile. He's gone from slavery to killing babies at birth to now just downright genocide. What started out in secret is now very public. And he wants them to throw into the Nile. Why the river and not kill them with a knife or just murder them? One, it was convenient and clean sort of way to kill infants. Many of the Egyptians lived at the edge of the Nile. So if you threw a baby in there, it could just float right off. It was a sewer system. It was the cleanest way to kill a baby. The child could be thrown into the river and disappear out of sight, and hopefully for the Egyptians, out of mind. They were gone. 
But the Egyptians also viewed the Nile as a god. They saw the Nile as the giver and taker of life. So if the Nile took the baby, it was the will of the Nile. And yet through all of this distress, heaven remained silent. God is not speaking. And even when the promise of rescue finally happens in Exodus 14, there is no explanation given to the people ever of why they suffered years and years of pain and anguish and loss. They don't get to the other side of the Red Sea and God sits them down and gives a powwow and tells them this is why you went through what you went through. He doesn't have to. Now you know you can say that many times our lives are like an experience without an explanation, adversity without purpose, hostility without protection. That is how life will always appear to the earthly people of God. See, one of the things I love about the Bible and why I believe the Word of God is absolutely true and not some man-made idea is because the Bible doesn't sugarcoat life. It's raw, it's real, it's many times tough to swallow. And yet you and I, we resonate with the characters because the characters are real people living in a broken world trying to figure out life and trying to get close to God and put a finger on what the heck he is up to in the midst of all of this pain and hardship. The same questions you and I have about life and about God are the same questions that these people in Egypt in bondage had. Think about it. Joseph has died almost 400 years ago. They haven't heard the voice of God in almost 400 years. No doubt they've wondered, God, you haven't talked to us in 400 years. God, are you dead? Are you tired of us? Are you on vacation? Do you still care for us? Have we burned our bridges to you and now you've chosen someone else to be your people? Have we sinned too much? Are we forgotten? Will this ever end? Will anyone ever come and rescue us? God, are you listening? God, we're suffering. Where are you? God, we're hurting. Where are you? God, we're hurt. We're wounded. And you're nowhere to be found. I wonder if the people of Israel were thinking through that when they were suffering, not knowing if God was ever going to show up. Let's look at our text, Exodus 2, verse 1. It says this, And a man from the home of Levi went and took as his wife a, Le a Levite woman. The woman conceived and bore a son, and when she saw that he was a fine child, she hid him for three months. Here we have God introducing a marriage of two Levites. You know, at the time, I don't think anyone thought that this was special. No one thought, wow, look at this couple. This is amazing for the two of them to get married. They get married and they go right back into slavery. Nothing special going on. But these two individuals dare to defy the orders of Pharaoh and started a family, and sure enough, they had a baby boy who on one hand brought a breath of fresh air to the family from the suffering that they were going through, but yet on the other hand, they're now faced with a crisis that they have to confront. The baby boy was a fine child, Scripture says. The word means to care about, to be fond of, want to keep. You've got to ask the question, what mom doesn't want, doesn't feel this way when she first sees her baby? But what is she going to do? She couldn't possibly dispose of him like trash into the Nile, and yet at any moment, an Egyptian could show up and discover there's a baby boy in the house and come grab him by the feet and throw him into the Nile themselves. So she decides to hide him. And that's a lot easier said than done because you're basically living in a tent. For three months, she's constantly hiding her son living in constant fear, her lips raw from constantly, repetitively trying to hush this baby. For three months, she hides him. The writer of Hebrews says it this way, By faith Moses, when he was born, was hidden for three months by his parents because they saw the child was beautiful and they were not afraid of the king's edict. 
Moses' mother trusted God to take care of the baby. She was living by faith in the character of God, even though she didn't appear to have any idea if God was even interested in her or her people at all. Verse 3. When she could hide him no longer, she took for him a basket made out of bulrushes and daubed it with bitumen and pitch. She put the child in it and placed it among the reeds by the riverbank. And his sister stood at a distance to know what would be done to him. So about three, four months, it became impossible for the baby to continue to be hidden. The first several months, the baby just laid there, not doing anything. But now there's movement. There's teething. There's possibly turning over. It's a whole new ball game now. You've got to constantly keep your eyes on the baby. The baby could just crawl right out of the tent. What was she going to do? The baby goes getting too active to be hidden in the tent. She had to do something or they would come and take the baby and throw him into the Nile. There was only one option that she had, and that was to hide the baby outside the tent. But she couldn't just leave him on the ground or leave him exposed to animals or birds that might get him. So she built him literally an ark. The word there for a boat is an ark. Me and George were having this conversation this week, and he pointed this out. It was basically the same word that's used for the ark in Genesis when Noah builds an ark. He builds him a place of shelter and safety and protection. She makes this boat a basket and did everything possible to make him safe. She made it watertight by sealing with kind of a tarp or seal, a sap. And then the language says she placed the baby in a basket and placed it among the reeds. You can see her tenderly doing these things with tears in her eyes, fully aware that she has no control of what's going to happen to the baby when she leaves him there. And she puts the baby among the reeds. The reeds would have kept the little boat from floating away down the Nile River, and she would still have access to it. She wasn't abandoning him. She was just trying to hide him. I'm sure she felt like a horrible mother doing all of this. But what choice did she have? You can imagine the tears in her eyes as she sees his big eyes staring back at her as she places him in the basket. As she shuts the top of the basket and she walks away thinking to herself, God, where are you? Where are you in all of this mess? Where are you that I have to put my baby in a river. Where are you? And yet in the background, we see her, her daughter, Moses' sister Miriam, who, like God, was watching over the baby. And Miriam was probably only somewhere between 8 and 10 years old at this point. She was young enough, that, old enough that she could be out on her own and be responsible and watch the baby. But she wasn't too old that she was working in the fields like another slave. There's drama that's building here. What's going to become of this baby? Will a crocodile eat it? Will it turn over at the current, in the current and the baby drown? Will the current break away from the reeds and send him lost down the Nile? This gets interesting. No wonder they make so many movies from the book of Exodus. Take it out, verse 5. Now the daughter of Pharaoh comes down to bathe at the river. While her young woman walked beside her, she saw the basket among the reeds and sent her servant woman, and she took it. And when she opened it, she saw the child, and behold, the baby was crying. And she took pity on him and said, This is one of the Hebrews' children. Now the daughter of the dictator enters the story. And as is typical for royalty, she isn't alone, but her mid maidservants are with her. And as she gets to the river, she sees something out of the corner of her eye that catches her attention that she hasn't seen before. No doubt this is the same spot that she has been bathing day in and day out for so long, but now over in the reeds, there's a basket. Odds are that this baby wasn't, hasn't been there for too long, not too many days in the basket. And curiosity gets the best of her. She could have ignored it, but something inside of her just wouldn't let it go. So she sends one of her maidservants 
Over to relieve it and to her astonishment, there's a crying baby inside. No doubt crying from being wet. No doubt crying from being hungry. No doubt be crying from being stuck in a dark basket. I'd probably be crying as well. And now, this is probably not the plan of the parents, of Moses' parents. And you can see Miriam almost putting her hands to her mouth to keep silent, to keep the gas from coming out, when she sees that the daughter of the king is now the baby, her brother, in her, in her hands. What's Miriam going to do? She's standing there watching the servants get the basket out of the water, take it to the daughter of the man that is making her family's life miserable. So you remember the Hebrews were basically like dirt to the Egyptians. The command from her own father was to kill every Hebrew boy by throwing them into the Nile. And here she was in the perfect position to do just that. All she had to do was flip the basket over, drop the baby in the water, and wash her hands of the whole thing. After all, the baby should have been dead a long time ago. He should have died three months ago. Where were the parents? Let's bring the parents out and kill them as well for defying Pharaoh's order. She could have done all of that. But the sovereignty of God and the common grace of God in the nature of women before a crying baby causes this baby to live. God is eminent. He is working even when you and I don't see him or hear his name. The text says that she took pity on the baby. And what we see here is not only does Moses' mother defy the orders of Pharaoh, but now Pharaoh's own daughter defies the orders of Pharaoh, and she lets the baby live. And here we see the invisible hand of God at work. Verse 7, And Moses' sister said to Pharaoh's daughter, Shall I go and call you a nurse from the Hebrew women to nurse the child for you? And Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Go! And so the girl went and called the child's mother, and Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Take this child away and nurse him for me, and I will give you your wages. So the woman took the child and nursed him. Miriam, this eight-year-old, nine-year-old, takes this bold move and takes a step toward Pharaoh's daughter. And without identifying herself as the sister of the baby, she asks if she can go get a nurse for the baby. She probably heard the princess say, hey, he's crying, he must be hungry, I can't leave him like this. And so she makes a bold move that took a lot of guts. This girl had no business talking to royalty. And she could have been killed for literally spying on the daughter of Pharaoh while she was taking a bath. And then she has the audacity to walk up and request a nurse, and then to request a Hebrew nurse. And yet here we find the daughter of Pharaoh saying, okay, just like her dad was when the midwife said, this is how the babies were coming out. And it gets even crazier. The daughter immediately goes and gets the mother. I would have loved to have been a fly on that wall when the daughter walks in and says, and grabs the mother and says, come with me, come with me. She ran home with excitement and dragged her mother out of the house to, to meet the princess of Egypt. The thoughts going through the mom's mind, this can't be good. No doubt the mom knew the boy would be dead, but not only was he alive, but now she's going to get paid to take care of her own son. The sovereignty of God. Imagine you thought you lost your son, and now the very government that said, we want your son dead, is now paying you to raise your son. But notice one caveat. Pharaoh's daughter says, take this child away and nurse him for me. She wanted the baby back. It would be a few years before the weaning was done, probably about four years or so, but she would get the baby for four years and then give him back to Pharaoh's daughter. Can you imagine both the joy and the suffering at the same time? 
God, you rescued my son, but now in a few years I've got to basically hand him over to people that don't know you, that don't love you, that in fact actually hate you and your people. There's joy here. There's suffering here. What is she going to do? Is she going to run away? I mean, she hit him the first time. Why not try it again? Maybe God was with her son, and maybe she could hide for a little while. Surely God didn't want this baby to be turned over to be educated and trained and brought up in, among the gods and the people of Egypt. That's not what God wants. Look at verse 10. When the child grew older, she brought him to Pharaoh's daughter, and he became her son. Moses' daughter named him Moses. Pharaoh's daughter named him Moses because I drew him out of the water. The mother brings the boy back to Pharaoh, and the text says that she basically adopted him as her own son. Can you imagine the parting there? And you can assume that Moses still had interaction with the family because when he meets Miriam and Aaron later, they're not strangers to him. But still, here is a mother having to give over her son to a world not knowing what would become of him. And Pharaoh's daughter gives him the name Moses. Not a profound name. Not a fascinating name. It me literally means a water log stick. That's what Moses' names means. A water log stick. You know, it's interesting in the Bible, people are named something unique because God has a plan for them. Abram was renamed Abraham, and the name Abraham means father of many nations. Israel was called God will prevail. Names meant something in Scripture. But here's Moses, a water log stick. A water log stick. That doesn't sound promising at all. That doesn't sound very optimistic about a future of God's plan or deliverance. Not much of a plan here at all. At least it doesn't look that way to you and I. From all indications, this baby was spared from death and would grow up to live a decent life and be royalty. No one expected that this little waterlogged stick would become the savior of Israel. You see, God is not mentioned in this text at all by name. And yet he is present, he is active, and he is working. He's eminent. The book of Exodus makes us face the continual darkness, which is often a part of our experience, while at the same time lifting the corner of the dark curtain to reveal that there is another story going on, that behind the scenes God is doing something we don't understand that the people who walk in darkness are on their way into a great light, that God is at work behind the scenes. You see, God is at work in the mundane and the small details and in the process of bringing his people out of darkness. We always want simple, quick solutions to the problem. Think about it. We can get anything we want now with a click of a button. We can go anywhere we want now in a short amount of time, and we can talk to anyone we want to around the world in just a few seconds. So why can't we have a quick answer from God to life's problems? Occasionally, God will give us and satisfy the desire, for the, but for the most part, he does not. And like the people in our story, we face the demand for persevering in faithfulness and patience, awaiting the coming day, trusting that he's at work in your life and my life. It was by faith that Moses' parents hid their baby boy. It was by faith that they entrusted him to the daughter of an evil dictator. It wasn't easy, but they believed that God was up to something. They believed that God was present, that God was near, that God was eminent. And we think... And we think as things get worse, God must be absent. But Exodus is teaching us that God is there. Every bad thing that Pharaoh tries backfires on him, but works out for the good of God's people. Moses is spared by being cast into the very Nile that was supposed to drown him. He is treated by kindness by the very daughter of the king who condemned him to die. 
He has assigned the responsibility with pay to the one woman in the entire world that wants the best for him, his mother. And he is then placed on Pharaoh's very own doorstep and raised in Pharaoh's own house. And only because of the decree to kill infants did Moses end up being trained by Pharaoh himself to be the liberator that he was called to be. The divine fingerprints of God are all over the story, even though it wasn't pretty for the people. See, listen, this story isn't just a good story or an inspiring story. It's a true story. If our problems were literary problems, then a good story would be good enough to solve them. But we live in time and space, and the difficulties we face are the difficulties of daily life. Loneliness, addiction, conflict, grief, disappointment, hurt, discouragement, loss, pain, death. We face that on a daily basis. We need a God who can actually do something about it. And we need a God who can help us and is involved in those details. We need a loving father, not an absentee father. We need a God who is at work in our homes and stays with us when we go to our jobs. And we have that in the God of the Bible. We have that. If God didn't save Moses the way the Bible says he saved him, it is doubtful that he can save anyone at all. God was at work in the baby's basket. How mundane, how common was that? And he's at work in your life and my life today. He's at your work in your life today even if you have no idea what he's up to. He's working. He called you by name. He knows you. He is ordering the steps that you take. He is at work in your life. He's brought you here this morning to peel back the blinders and call you to himself. I love the words of the prophet Habakkuk. He says, look among the nations and see and wonder and be astounded For I am doing a work in your days that you would not believe if I told you. We ask, how do we know? How do we really know that God is at work in the details of my life? See, because if you look closely at the story, you see the great story unfolding once and for all that God is at work in our universe. And that's the story of the gospel of Jesus. Think about it. At one moment in history, at one moment, God's entire plan of triumphing over evil was in a tiny boat among the reeds of the Nile River, crying. 1,500 years later, in one moment of history, God's entire plan of triumphing over sin and death and hell and even Satan himself was in a tiny manger among sheep and goats and animals crying. As Moses would be taken up out of the Nile River and his name pronounced, in the very same way Jesus would be taken out of the river and his father would come down in the form of a dove dove, and he would say, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And just like no one expected Moses' life to ever become much of anything, not many people expected much from this little carpenter boy from Nazareth named Jesus. Even his very name was common among that day. No one expected Moses to be the Savior of Israel. No one expected Jesus to be the Savior of the world. But unlike Moses, Jesus would be raised to become a king. Jesus would not be raised to become a king like Moses was, but he would be raised to become a carpenter. Not to have authority, but to give up authority. Not to thrive in the riches of Egypt, but to die in the poverty of death. You see, the mother of Moses would have to give up her son to the world to rescue people from slavery in Egypt and and to the grip of Pharaoh. But God the Father would have to give up his son to the world, to the flesh, to the devil himself, 
to rescue you and I from the slavery of sin and the grip of Satan. See, guys, God is active. He is at work in you right now. And I don't know what you're going through in your life, but I know that if you belong to Jesus, and if that is true, then he is at work in your life. It might not seem like it, it might not feel like it, but he is a good, good father who has your good in mind, even in the midst of hardship, pain, and difficulty. God is active. You don't hear the name of God at all in the first 10 verses of Exodus 2. But when you look behind the scenes, you see that God is orchestrating every little detail so that this little baby boy could be in the basket at the exact place so that Pharaoh's daughter can find him and he can grow up to become the savior of the people of Israel. God is working. And you don't see him in all the details of your life, but one day you're going to look back and say, God was putting me here and put me in this job and put me in this place and put me and gave me this opportunity and opened this door for me and shut this door for me and all of this so that at the end of the day, his name could be glorified and he can make something of me. You don't see it now, but God is actively working in your life and my life. You just have to trust him. Some of you have gone through incredible amounts of pain and hardship and difficulties. And some of you are, even in this week, have gone through pain, hardships, and disappointments. And you wonder, God, are you there? Are you listening? Are you, do you care? And God says, I'm working. I'm working. I'm shutting some doors in your life, but in the midst of the process, if you trust me, I'm going to open something else for you. I'm going to do something new for you. And then one day you're going to look back and you're going to see, wow, God. I didn't enjoy that process, but I'm glad I went through it because I'm here today because of what I had to go through. And you were slowly working those details of my life. The hardest thing for us to do is to trust God when we don't see him, when we don't feel him, when we don't experience him. But you're here this morning to be reminded that he's working. He's working. Right now, he's working in your life. Right now, those doors that seem shut in your life, maybe God shut those doors because he has something better for you. Right now, where you're frustrated and discouraged and you feel like, God, what are you doing? Maybe God is up to something so much bigger. The question is, can you trust him? Can you trust him today? See, this communion table that we celebrate every week reminds me that I can trust him. Because when I don't have things figured out, I can't figure out what I'm doing this week. But God has taken care of my eternity. And if he can take care of the big things, of my salvation and my future, This week, whatever I'm going to go through, I can trust him. I can trust him. I can trust him. So as you come to the table this morning, and as the bread represents the body of Jesus that was broken for you, the juice represents the blood of Jesus that was spilled for you, for your salvation, so that God can be your father and he can be involved in your life as you partake of that communion table. May you be reminded that he is with you. He is involved. Even if you don't feel him, he is there. I'm going to invite you to take some time meditating. Whenever you're ready, you're welcome to come and grab the elements from the table and go back to your seats. And what we want to do is we want to make people available to pray with you this morning. And so Jordan and Shannon are going to be on either side of the communion table. If you want someone to pray with you this morning, whatever you're going through, maybe it's finals week and you just need someone to pray with you for wisdom. Maybe you're going through something in your life and you just want someone to pray with you. These guys are available this morning. Um, just go up to them, tell them your need, let them pray with you. You can even say it's an unspoken, let them pray with you. And just have someone to pray with you this morning. And so if you need that, that's available. But let's just worship this God who is actively working in your life and my life.
that would do all the details of our lives so he can bring you here this morning so that you can be reminded